I'm here to talk to you today about Raiders of the Fast Start Front End Performance Archaeology. Um, if you're not a fan of Indiana Jones, I apologize in advance. Hopefully you can still get something out of this talk and still laugh at the jokes. Um, but there's, get ready, because there's a lot of Indiana Jones. Um, so in, like Steve said, I'm Katie. I'm a staff engineer on the front end systems team at Etsy. I also made this website called Oh Shit Git. Um, you can find me on Twitter at either Kay Seiler or Oh Shit Git. Um, and as he mentioned, I just collaborated with Julia Evans to take the content from Oh Shit Git and turn it into a zine. Um, and especially today, for people here, if you go to these URLs with the Perf Now discount code, you can download the, um, the zine for only five euro, which normally it's like eight euro 80 or something. Um, so if you want to take a picture of that. Don't do it now because you got to listen to me talk about something completely different. <laughs> but okay, so why am I here if I do front-end systems, I do a lot of design systems, I talk about Git, why am I talking about performance? So about a year and a half ago, my um, team was put on this new project at work where we were given a task to fix performance of one of our mobile web pages. And so I was talking at uh, FluentConf with Kyle Simpson and telling him, oh, this is what I'm working on and this is my project. And he was like, oh my God, Katie, you have to come back next year and do a talk about this and you have to call it performance archaeology. And I was like, yes, because not only do I love Indiana Jones, but I actually studied archaeology as an undergraduate. Um, I spent a summer in Belize, <laughs> doing archaeology um, on Mayan ruins and digging up things in caves. And yes, those are human remains from a human sacrifice ritual that we dug up. Um, so <laughs> unsurprisingly, talking about development and archaeology is something that's like right up my alley. So I'm totally going to stretch this metaphor like until it breaks. <laughs> now, this might shock you a little, but Indiana Jones doesn't actually do any real archaeology. Um, the closest he gets is when he's in the classroom and he delivers this great line, we do not follow maps to buried treasure and X never ever marks the spot. Real archaeology is not glamorous. It's backbreaking, it's really labor intensive, a lot of research is involved. Um, you have to have really careful attention to detail, but a lot of times you never actually go anywhere with it. And this is a lot like trying to fix the performance of legacy code. <laughs> so real archeology span is the study of human culture through its physical remains. We dig up what um, people left behind in the dirt in order to understand the culture of the people who made those things. Performance archaeology is also about culture. When you do performance archaeology, like I did, um, you uncover a lot of really fascinating insights into your development culture and where it's falling down and where it's working. Um, you know, so a lot of times people are up here talking about, oh, you have to get this number, you have to get that number. And we're going to talk about that, but I'm also going to really talk a lot about performance culture. All right, so how do you do archaeology? Um, first of all, it's a science. You don't just fly to Nepal, get the headpiece of raw, and then run off on, across the world. Um, you actually have to start with a hypothesis. Then you conduct a survey. So when you conduct a survey, you spend a lot of time in the library. You do a bunch of reading. Um, you, you, you know, find out what all the existing research on the area is. You use tools like ground-penetrating radar to help you look under the surface of your dig site. Um, then once you fully understand the question that you want answered and the context that you're asking it in, you start to dig. Um, and then finally, you take what you've found and you interpret it. You tell a story about the site, you tell a story about the people that lived there. And the work that we did 100% followed this process. Uh, so let's get the ball rolling and talk about some archaeology. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a look at our dig site. So our team had been tasked with improving the front end load performance of the mobile version of the listing page on Etsy. So this is like the most important page on the entire site. It's how buyers take a look at items. Um, it's how they buy stuff. There's a big red button that says put it in your cart. Um, so it's a lot of times it's the first entry that people have in the site. They'll do a Google search and they'll end up on this page. But from a technical perspective, it was really nicely um, 
separated from the rest of the site because we use UA detection to actually serve up a completely different set of templates and a completely different set of code than the desktop version of this site. But there were a lot of downsides. Um, this mobile version of the site was created in 2012. <laughs> so there was like five and a half years worth of accumulated cruft and a whole ton of tech debt that we had to sift through. Um, and also the page was under active development while we were working on it. So you know we had a lot of challenges that we faced. Now before we pick up our trowels and we start our digs, let's take a look at what our hypothesis is. So Etsy overall at the time, 67% of all site traffic came from mobile app and mobile web visits. But like a lot of other retailers, we had this problem where um, our mobile sales or our mobile, what we call GMS or gross merchandise sales, um, wasn't the same percentage. So um, there's plenty of opportunity here for us to try to move that GMS number. So we took a look at our existing RUM or real user monitoring um, data that we had. We had a really great performance team who built this awesome tool that we track all of this internally. Um, so we chose DOM content loaded time just because it was what we had. I know that a lot of folks at this conference are going to tell you DOM content loaded isn't exactly the right measurement. It's not what you should focus on, but it's what we had in our pocket. Um, we had all the data. So we decided that that was the closest that we could get to understanding real users' experiences using the site. So the histogram here is showing the distribution of times you can see. I mean, zero um, all the way to five seconds. We have that long tail that Tim talked about of higher than five seconds, but um, based on our data, 95% of our users are actually five seconds or less. So um, we didn't really focus on that too much. Um, next, we looked at conversion. Um, now, I can't actually tell you the real percentages here, but I can tell you that when you look at DOM content loaded time versus conversion rate, for every second that you add, our conversion went down. Um, and I promise you, it is to scale. I just can't give you the actual numbers, unfortunately. Now, if we think back to the population of folks that were in each of these um, DOM content loaded buckets, we have a lot of room for improvement. A lot of people are in those much lower converting two, three, four, or five second buckets. So what we wanted to do was try to move them up into that one second bucket that has a much higher conversion rate. All right, so this is our hypothesis. It's a no-brainer. Improving the performance of the listing page will increase conversion. Awesome. Fortune and glory. <laughs> no, nobody? No? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, so we had a pretty solid hypothesis. Next, we decided to go out and do our survey. Now, the folks on my team, we're front-end systems. We were not performance experts by any stretch of the imagination. So we went out, we read a ton of books, we watched conference videos. A lot of the folks who are up on this stage today like, really helped inform a lot of the work that we did because I read their stuff, which is pretty cool to actually like, be up here with them when two years ago I barely knew anything about front-end performance. Um, so we, a lot of these most commonly cited performance best practices, a lot of them come from Steve's book that he wrote in 2008. We were already actually doing them. So, um, you know, we've had this performance culture. It was really um, well supported for a while. Over the last few years, it hadn't been supported quite as much. Um, but, you know, we, we had this really great set of practices in place already. So we just had to figure out, now what? <laughs> you know, what are we going to do? <laughs> So we decided that we were going to focus on improving the initial loading performance of the page. So that thing that Anna said, you know, is only getting you like climbing to the top of the mountain, not actually at the top of the mountain. But hey, you have to start somewhere. <laughs> um, so anyways, we really wanted to improve this initial load performance for our new vid visitors. So how quickly do they receive confirmation the page is loading? How quickly do they see the most important information on the page? And how quickly can they interact with the page? So these were the things that we kind of wanted to improve. 
And to do that, we decided we were going to look at our critical rendering path. So optimizing your critical rendering path really means optimizing the loading and the rendering of your above-the-fold content. Now, I spent like the last 10 years telling every designer that I've worked with that there is no fold. So I can't believe I'm actually saying like above the fold right now. <laughs> but it's, it's like a useful abstraction when you're talking about load performance. You really want people to see that initial screen, especially on mobile, as quickly as you can. But again, now what? How do you actually do that? You know, you go out and you read all of these like brilliant people are talking about, you have to get this number and that number and this other thing. But there's this huge gap where that nobody tells you what to do when you have five and a half years worth of JavaScript. Nobody tells you, where do you start? You know, we, we really didn't have the option of just throwing it all away or burning it down as much as I would have loved to do that. Um, so we had to come up with something else. How are we going to do this? So the way that we figured out how we are going to improve performance of this page was we made heavy use of our ground penetrating radar, which for our purposes is webpagetest.org. I'm sorry, I'm sure everyone is sick to death <laughs> of hearing about web page test. Pat is off wherever Pat is, like, yes. Um, <laughs> we also used some other tools, like we used um, Chrome Dev Tools, we used Lighthouse Audits, but I didn't save any of that data, so I couldn't really show it, but I saved all of these web page test runs, so that's mostly what we're going to be looking at. All right, so just as a refresher, this is what the listing page looks like. Um, so at the top there, you can see there's the site header, there's this information about the shop and the shop avatar. Then we have this main listing image carousel, which is like all of the pictures. And then we have the description and some more stuff below the fold. So we're trying to get this all to load as quickly as humanly possible. So we started out, we ran a bunch of tests using an iPhone 6 running iOS 9 over a 3G slow network. Now, if you remember, our RUM data showed that this is really not at all our typical user experience. But it's still really useful to do this to figure out like what happens in the worst case scenario. Um, and also, I think that it's really good to help you compare the before and after, which as we go through, we'll see how these numbers are changed based on the work that we did. Um, so there's, you know, like I said, there's a whole bunch of these different metrics, but the two that we're really focusing on are start render, which was eight and a half seconds, which is pretty abysmal, um, and then that DOM content loaded time, which again isn't the best measure, but um, it was the best data that we had available. Um, and that was 12.1 seconds, which is also abysmal. And I also want to point out, like Tim talked about this morning, um, you know, it's not just about the time that it takes to download things over the network. It's the amount of stuff and that cost to your users, particularly users who have low income or who have a pay-as-you-go data plan. And we, oops, oops, and we were at four dollar signs. Ah, I pushed the wrong button. Um, we were at four dollar signs, and we wanted to decrease that. All right, so let's look at the waterfall, but not this waterfall, because this is from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which is a terrible movie. <laughs> so this kind of waterfall, the web page test waterfall. So how many of you feel like super comfortable like reading these? It's okay if you don't raise your hand? Yeah, it's overwhelming, right? So we're gonna go through this step by step together. All right, so <laughs> across the top of our waterfall, we have the time in seconds of loading. The green vertical bar there is when start render fires. And then this little kind of pinky um, plus yellow, that's when um, DOM interactive and DOM content loaded fire. In our case, they happen pretty much simultaneously. There are certain cases where it won't, but for our purposes, we basically are gonna ignore the interactive and just think about DOM content loaded. And then all the way over on the right at like 19 plus whatever seconds is um, document complete, which we aren't really thinking about. We aren't really caring about that right now. Again, it's important, but for our purposes, we're not going to think about it too much. All right, so now the first block of files that are downloading for the user is CSS. Now this is great. We want our CSS to load absolutely first, because the way that a website um, or a web page is constructed by a browser, first it downloads and parses all of the DOM, it downloads and parses all of the CSS to create the CSS DOM, and then it smushes them together and goes through that whole layout paint compositing cycle that um, Anna told us all about yesterday. 
However, you can see we load in five different CSS files, and a lot of these are not actually used. So we're wasting not only like network time, but we're wasting CSS, CSS OM construction time. Now, the next thing that loads are some related listing images. Now, these are not that big carousel, that big image that we want. These actually appear below the fold, um, so they're not part of our critical rendering path. Then we download two different sizes of that little shop avatar image instead of downloading one <laughs> and displaying it twice. Um, then we get into our JavaScript. We download three different JS files, um, two large ones and then one that's a little bit smaller. Now these are all blocking our DOM content loaded from firing. You can kind of see it all the way over there. And then all these little pink bars, that is JavaScript execution. So like Steve was telling us about yesterday, the problem with JavaScript is it's not just the size, it's when you decompress it and the browser has to actually execute all of that JavaScript. So you can see we've got a lot <laughs> of JavaScript. <laughs> then we download some more of those similar listing images. These ones are actually down at the very bottom of the page, so we care even less about them. And then around C uh, six seconds, we've had all of our CSS is downloaded, the CSS OM is complete, and now the browser has enough of the DOM available that it's decided, okay, I need to download these um, CSS background images and this one icon font. Um, and then around eight and a half seconds there, you can see the green fires. Um, that's start render. And then I'm going to skip over. There's a bunch of requests here for third-party stuff. I'm sorry, Harry. Um, <laughs> it wasn't on our, um, you know, on our like roadmap to be able to attack any of that, so we sort of had to ignore it. Unfortunately, we're going to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> and finally, for our 36th request, we finally go off and download that main listing image. The most important thing on the whole page is request 36. 36. <laughs> <laughs> Another bummer is actually that like the rest of these images that we're downloading, in, they're in the carousel, but you don't actually see them unless you swipe. Um, so we're downloading these huge images and people might not even ever look at them. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> so, um, the rest of this isn't really very interesting. We make some calls to internal logging. We download some more stuff. Um, page load is complete. But uh, something that's also really important to look at is this little graph down at the bottom of the waterfall. So um, this indicates the browser main thread. You can see the effect of all of our old school jQuery that fires a ton on document.ready. We've got this big red block here that is um, the page is not interactive. So that means that if at that time the user tries to click the Add to Cart button, nothing will happen, <laughs> which is no good for us. All right, so I don't know about you, but I think we've got a lot of room for improvement, right? <laughs> so from all of this, we downloaded four pretty obvious areas that we could improve. Uh, first, lazy load all of those below the fold images so that we could prioritize that main one that we actually care about. Um, we wanted to move up our start render time by reducing the amount of CSS that needs to be downloaded for the browser to construct that CSS OM. And then we wanted to remove a couple of those unnecessary HTTP requests for background images and icon fonts and replace those out with SVGs instead. And then finally, we wanted to reduce the download size and again, as Steve pointed out, more importantly, the execution cost of all of that um, unused JavaScript. All right, so let's whip this page into shape. No, again, no. <laughs> um, all right, so let's excavate. <laughs> So the, the way that ar archaeologists excavate, you don't just go in and like dig willy-nilly. Um, you build these things called test pits. So it's like a little one by one meter square hole in the ground. Um, and this is actually a picture of a test pit that I excavated. I found a um, like six, seven centimeter long obsidian blade that had been used in bloodletting rituals in the cave. Um, I found it by putting my hand on it, and it's stuck in my hand. Um, <laughs> All right, so this is actually a really great corollary with how we do our development at Etsy because we love experimentation. We literally don't do anything. We don't make any change to the site without running it as an A-B experiment. Um, 
So we took these areas for improvement, we broke them down into um, smaller experiments that we could run, we put them out to 50% of the population, and then we were able to look at our RUM data broken down per population to see what effect this had, if any, on those um, measures that we care about. So, first test pit, lazy loading. <clears throat> So as a refresher, we were downloading 37 images, which was 814 kilobytes, but most of those weren't in the crit critical rendering path. There really was only two, that avatar and then that main listing image. Um, and if you remember, 36, <laughs> bad. <laughs> So you can see it in the video, but our lazy loading strategy works by displaying a background color that we take from the image itself. And then once the user scrolls within a certain threshold, um, we load the image in. I actually had to throttle the network significantly for the video to actually see that flip for you. Um, most users, they don't actually even see it load in. So this was easy. Um, the code was already in place. All we had to do was turn it on. Like literally all I had to do was change one value from true or false to true. So this was like the best. So we did some um, synthetic testing, which was non-significant. This was basically just opening up a web page test again. And you can see, this is something that we saw with every single one of our experiments. And this is why it's really important not to look at that average or look at that median, um, is that you know, every, as the network speed gets worse, so Wi-Fi, then your 4G, then down to 3G, the impact of all of our work got bigger. So, um, you know, the, the slow devices are gonna be much more impacted than these high speed devices and fast connections that all of us use when we're doing our development. All right, so test pit number two. Let's take a look at tackling that CSS file size. So again, we had five different CSS files loading into the page. It was 98 kilobytes um, compressed, which uncompressed out to uh, 0.62 megabytes, which is a lot. <laughs> and from our Lighthouse audits, we knew that a lot of this was not actually being used, uh, which is like double woof. Um, so we clearly needed to remove a bunch of that bloat. But we had all of that experimentation happening on the page, so it was like really, really hard for us to figure out what do we actually need. Um, what we ended up doing was we used automation. So my colleague, Allie Jones, wrote the script that popped open a headless browser in Selenium um, and then runs a third-party package called UnCSS to determine all of the CSS selectors that were actually in use in the different pages that we fed in to the program. And then it output a brand new file with only the CSS that's in used on the page. Um, but this really was a less than ideal situation. It did the job, but on the long term, it, like we didn't capture every single state immediately with all of our, um, you know, rendered HTML that we fed into the tool. So we had to keep adding more and more and more CSS back in as every time that we found a bug. Um, but once we had a relatively bug-free experience, we ran that as an experiment. Um, again, we saw the same synthetic pattern as lazy loading. You can see the, the green, uh, Orange bar is before, the little pink bar is what we saw with lazy loading, and then the red bar is what we saw when we reduced CSS. So it's actually working a little better for us. So we completed the work for both of these phases at the same time, so we decided to roll them out as a combined experiment to 50% of our users. And our RUM data, now these are the averages, um, but you can see we had awesome results. Our DOM content loaded time went down by 6%, and our page load was down 13.2%, most likely because of all of the lazy loading of the images. Um, so our internal RUM tool, Sonic, has this awesome feature where you can actually look at one of those CDF graphs. Again, as you move out percentile to the right, you're essentially looking at people on slower connections. And again, you can see that like, there's a much bigger difference for folks on a slower connection than people on a super fast connection like us, which was a negligible difference. And, da da da, conversion went up. <laughs> Yay, X really does mark the spot. <laughs> um, so we proved our hypothesis, right? We, we, you know, making your page faster increases conversion. But we didn't rest on our laurels. We had those four things that we wanted to do. We've only done two of them, so let's move forward and do the rest. All right, switching to SVGs. 
So again, as a reminder, we had five uh, CSS background images. Every single one of them could essentially be replaced with an S SVG. None of them were like real bitmaps that we needed. And then we had one icon font, which Zach told us yesterday is an anti-pattern. Um, we don't want it anyways, so we said, yeah, let's, let's cut it out. Um, this change, actually, we didn't really see a very big effect on DOM content loaded in our synthetic testing. Um, I actually broke out here. You can see this is logged out and this is logged in. And logged in had a slightly bigger effect because I think when you're logged in, you get more icons in the header than when you're logged out. But when we averaged everything together, it was basically like negligible. Um, so we put this out as a user-facing experiment. And just like Indy, we discovered this switcheroo wasn't really as lucrative as we had hoped it was going to be. Um, we saw like 1% difference in our RUM data and our synthetic tests. And it didn't actually affect our conversion rate at all. Um, you can see pretty much neutral. There's a little bit of a difference, but not really enough. Um, you know, neutral, neutral. But it was the right thing to do. So we ended up ramping it up to 100% for all of our users anyways, just because, like Zach said, icon fonts are an anti-pattern. They cause um, re-rendering of the page when they load in, so we cut them out. All right, so let's check in and see how we're doing. Um, let's take a look at our web page test waterfall now. Um, so again, you can kind of see the change. So 44% change in start or decrease in start render, 10% uh, decrease in time to first interactive, 60% decrease in our CSS size, and a 32% decrease in the number of images that we were loading. So we really improved. This is really like, Awesome. Um, and our waterfall, so now we're down to two CSS files instead of five. Um, and our listing images actually load next. Hooray. <laughs> Number three instead of 36. And um, we're down to only one of those shop avatar images instead of two. And we still have these two really big JavaScript files, which we're going to talk about next. Um, but Actually, no, a CSS background image kind of snuck back in. This just illustrates how hard our work was because people were like doing active development on the page at the same time that we were trying to do this. So somebody added a new feature and added back in one of these pesky background images, which was <laughs> super annoying. <laughs> Um, then a bunch of more uninteresting stuff, but the important thing is that our waterfall is way shorter. Before we had um, 71 requests, and now we only have 56. And you can see that big block that we had before DOM content loaded is now um, one big block when that document.ready jQuery fires. So we improved. All right, so before we go into the next phase of our work, we're going to talk about another concept from archaeology. This one is stratigraphy. So, um, stratig like, uh, blah, 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 blah. stratigraphy is a hard word to say. I don't know why I included it. Uh, anyway, so Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States, he actually is the father of modern archaeology. So, he came up with this concept of stratigraphy, which is the idea that you have these layers of stuff in the dirt, and the deeper down something is, the older it generally is. So let's look at our JavaScript stratigraphy. <laughs> it's not pretty. So 2010, like everybody else, we primarily used jQuery. Um, we had our own homegrown system that would take all of those files and concatenate them and build them and serve them out. Um, in 2011, we improved upon that by adding this like Rails style, we called it sprockets, um, that would allow you to indicate dependencies um, dynamically, and then the build system would put them all together for you. Um, this relied a ton on passing things around in the global namespace. You can see like window.etsy was in every single file. Um, and now we know, you know, obviously polluting the global namespace is like a real bad no-no, but at the time, it was good. Um, <laughs> then in 2012, we switched to RequireJS, which uses AMD dependencies to do dependency management. Um, but fast forward to 2017, and all this stuff still exists. Um, we're actually, hopefully, in the next like two months, going to be rolling out Webpack. So I'm really excited, because we're finally going to get rid of this stuff. And we'll actually be able to start using ES6. I know, right? Like, <laughs> we don't use ES6. Shudder. 
Um, yeah, so our JavaScript belongs in a museum. <laughs> but I have really high hopes for modernizing our code base, but this is really gonna come back and bite us, you'll see. <laughs> so, all right, so we wanna reduce the amount of JavaScript that we are executing on the page. How are we gonna do that? Well, like Yoav said yesterday, when it comes to asset bloat, or not yesterday, today, sorry, load only what you need. Um, so we wanted to do that, but we had stuff in the way. So we have two main files that we're looking at. First, we have like a page specific file, and then we have this global base file. So <laughs> again, as you have said, looking at all of your dependencies, we had 121 dependencies in the first file and 124 in the second file. So 245 dependencies that we had to take a look at. So again, we took a look at automation first to see if automation is gonna help us. Um, um, like Adrian was talking about yesterday, Closure Compiler by Google. We took a look at that, but no types. So with all of our ancient JavaScript code, like we really couldn't use like modern automated tools that do things like tree shaking and static analysis because it just, like our code was just such a disaster. So what then? Um, so well, while we worked on a better solution, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute, I actually decided that I was gonna go in and look at every single one of these files and try to figure out if they were in use or not, um, which was kind of crazy. I kind of regret it, but I wanted to like move this project forward while we tried to automate this. Um, so what does that mean? So I took a look at every JS file, like what is it doing? Are the functions called? If there's a jQuery selector, does that exist in a template? Um, if that jQuery selector exists in the template, then is it actually, you know, is that template being used in any of our PHP views? And if that PHP view is actually in use, which a lot of them weren't, um, is there actually a PHP controller somewhere that's con like conditionally loading this? Um, you know, is this actually turned on in production? Is it a five-year-old feature that got turned off and nobody deleted any of the code? Which actually happened, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then if that experiment is off, we can probably, maybe, hopefully delete it. So I did this 245 times. Um, I don't recommend it. <laughs> JavaScript is basically a pit of snakes. Um, really, don't do it. <laughs> All right, so I actually did remove a lot of code doing this. I'm not bitter, I promise. Um, so we had a 25% reduction in that page-specific file, and then we had a 33% reduction in that global file. Um, synthetic tests, awesome. Everything went down except for some reason start render went up a tiny little bit, not sure why. Um, and we ran this as an experiment. And our numbers were awesome too. So DOM content loaded was 2.9% faster and page load was like 1.6% faster. But, oh, this is where things really start to get disappointing. So our CDF graph is not very different. Again, you can see there's a tiny bit of separation over in like the starting in the 50th percentile or so. Um, but conversion went down. This was a bummer. Like we decided that we were gonna shut it down after like five days when we started to see that conversion was going down. And this really underscores to me the point that like while everything looks really good in synthetic tests, you still need that real user data to help you make conclusions about what's happening for real users in real situations with your code. Um, so why did this happen? We don't really know <laughs> why. The best hypothesis that we could come up with was that I actually deleted something that was super important. <laughs> um, <laughs> or maybe, you know, it was funny, actually we tried to figure out, but we couldn't find like the smoking gun. My hypothesis was that a bunch of events that were not firing before because people were downloading too much JavaScript and the JavaScript just never even executed was actually executing and was affecting our test results, but we couldn't find any proof for that, so that was kind of a bummer. But, um, you know, I had to let it go. <laughs> but it was okay, because we had something better coming down the pipeline. So we proved that no matter how detailed you are, when you have this like under, completely non-deterministic relationship between all of your JavaScript code and like your experiment code and your server code, that like it doesn't matter how much of a like a 
anal retentive perfectionist you are, like me, um, you still are going to mess up. So what we wanted to do was to capture real data from real users in real browsers about what JavaScript was actually getting called when they interacted with the page. Um, so around the time that we started working on this project, um, Chrome came out with their coverage tab, which is exactly the data that we wanted. It's a really good tool if you haven't tried it. You pop it open, it shows you um, all of the functions that get called, it shows you how much of the file is used versus unused. As you click around and interact with the page, the data updates automatically. So we needed this. But we couldn't do this with real you couldn't be like, knock, knock, can you please turn on the code coverage tab? And you, no, no. So um, how are we going to do that? So we actually wrote this thing called Vimes. Um, I don't know if there's any other like book nerds, but it's named after the Discworld character, Sam Vimes, who's a detective. Yes! <laughs> I'm mixing my metaphors here, but oh well, we're going to go with it. Um, so we used an abstract, abstract syntax tree, or AST, to basically take a look at all of our JavaScript files, pull out all of the functions, and then rewrite them so that they would automatically log themselves in the browser. Um, and then we served that up to users. We captured their actions, so every time somebody clicked on something, when that function got called, we logged it. Then we sent all of those logs both on load and then on page unload um, so that we could compare and take a look with the idea of maybe splitting it into um, that initial like critical JavaScript and then lazy load the rest. We didn't end up having time to do that, but that was the idea. Then we map all those calls back to their source files and then we use that data to actually go in and delete. So this is a much better process. So this is what it looks like. Um, our, this is the base.js file. We had 127,000 log lines to look at, so we aggregated all of that data and created this visualization that uses a color scale to show us what's used and unused. So anything with like a gray background was never called. Um, anything with a white background, we didn't instrument because it was something that was guaranteed to always fire, so it wasn't worth logging. Um, and then anything, you can see kind of the scale, so the purple stuff was called the least times, and the green stuff was called the most times. So this still required some human intervention, because you, know, you can see a lot of these blocks, these function blocks are like massive. Um, so we had to kind of take a look and just double check that everything was good. But with this, um, we managed to actually delete 28% of the page-specific file and 37% of that global base file. So we did even a little bit better than when I was doing it manually. We ran this as an experiment. And again, it was a minor impro like improvement in load times, 2.7% on DOM content loaded, one2 for page load. And again, our CDF is not looking all that great. Um, but conversion went up. So with this one, we didn't actually move that DOM content loaded measure that we were aiming for. I think this helped with time to interactive. And I think that we, I don't, I didn't save a, uh, a run through on web page test to prove it, but I think if I remember correctly, the, that little red bar was shorter. So I think that's what really saved us here. All right, so we did it, yay! <laughs> Hooray for us. <laughs> All right, so let's interpret our results. So this is kind of a no-brainer, but it's really good to see direct evidence on our conversion rate that performance directly affects the conversion rate of your website. Um, go back to your bosses and tell them this <laughs> and say, we need help. Um, this is important. So the magic number for us seemed to be about a 200 millisecond reduction in DOM content loaded. Some other teams actually went out and did some other lazy loading experiments after we proved this. And with all of them, like the average was about 200 milliseconds. Anything less than that didn't really seem to nudge conversion in any direction. Um, Front-end performance is just as important as back-end, if not more. So <laughs> the guy that actually wrote PHP, Rasmus Lerdov, he works with me. And I was giving this presentation uh, like internally, and he said to me, he was like, 
why do I agonize over every millisecond of server time when front end is like many orders of magnitude worse? And I was like, yes, fix it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, in the client side, we, we, you know, we really, really agonized over the back end, but the front end was like, put it in the browser and just forget about it. <laughs> you know, like top men will work on it someday. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we had all of this code that was written in 2012 and 2013 that hadn't been touched and those people had moved on to other companies and we had no idea what was even in use or how to delete it. Um, you know, so we're working on improving that and we're working on re-architecting our code to like better help us support deletion. And this is something I think everybody has said is that our, user ex our, our experiences are really not our users' experiences, especially when it comes to mobile. Um, again, every single one of those CDF graphs, you could see that everything had a much bigger effect on people at the slower end of the spectrum than on the faster end of the spectrum. So, you know, it takes a lot of extra time and effort to do real user testing, but it's so worth it because it helped us to really, like, prove this this. Um, fact. All right, so this was a really hard lesson for me personally to learn is that small scale performance tweaks don't always pan out. Um, so like Steve was saying yesterday, <laughs> there's that 3% of like really critical things. We tried some stuff that clearly wasn't in the 3%. I, I didn't even mention a whole bunch of them because they really didn't pan out. Um, but we really had our best luck when we focused on those main things. And um, for me, this is, I think, one of the bigger insights is that you want to try to get your architecture to match your development culture. For us, that meant experimentation. Like, we had this great experimentation framework. Everybody used it. But the experimentation wasn't actually being reflected in our front end. So we had this, like, static top-level CSS and JavaScript dependency management. Um, but you know, it ended up being that because it was such a pain in the butt to fork at a really low level, people would just put all of the code for both versions of every experiment into one file and serve it to every single user on the site. And even worse, they would never go back and actually delete the stuff that belonged to the experiment that lost. Um, so what we're working on now and what my team just launched like a month ago is a dynamic front-end dependency management that happens at our PHP component level, which is where all of the experimentation takes place. So for CSS, we built a system that will um, take each individual module dependency and roll it up to the top, create a big long URL that lists out all the files, and then when the user requests that, it will go off to a dynamic asset server that dedupes and concatenates and bundles all of those together and then serves them to the user so that everybody gets a, like, just for them bundle that is all for the experiment that they're in. Um, and now, after we get Webpack out, we're going to work on something similar for our JavaScript. All right, and if you take one thing away from this talk, it is this. Architect for deletion. Everything that you write is going to disappear someday. Think about that. Build it so that future archaeologists can actually like, look at your code and determine the relationships between things. Um, make it easy for you know, future you or future others to actually go in and delete stuff. And finally, Performance culture is not self-sustaining. I think I mentioned this a couple times, but you know, Etsy has this great like, reputation as being a place with a good performance culture, but with people leaving, new people coming in, new leadership coming in with new ideas, we had really fallen behind in taking care of the performance of our site, and it was becoming blatantly obvious. And when we did that, we were offloading our like, internal lack of culture onto our users, which you don't want to do, right? Your users are awesome. Like, they give you money. They make it so that you have like, a way to live. Um, <laughs> so now what my team is working on is figuring out how do we make this performance culture sustainable? How do we keep it going? And I'm super excited. Michelle is going to talk this afternoon about how they've been building the performance culture at Pinterest. I've seen her talk about it before. It's awesome. I want to steal like literally everything that they do at Pinterest. Um, and that's it. So thank you. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Katie. Let's do some Q&A. I, 
I love finding other speakers who laugh at the jokes in their slides, even if none of the attendees, <laughs> none of the audience does. <laughs> I think my jokes are hilarious. They are. I'm, yeah. I crack myself up. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, first, you know, I know you've done this presentation a couple times. Uh, have you had much impact on the sales of ferret pins? Do you know? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, that would be good. I should probably just buy one myself. Could I've you done pick, it enough. Could you pick my store for, for your next uh, okay. set of slides? Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing you talked about, you know, the JavaScript refactoring was really hard. You talked about the CSS also and how when you tried to clean that up, um, you found bugs, you know, which I'm assuming were basically, oh, like this condition, this path got traversed and we didn't have it styled correctly. Mm -hmm. So we have to add that CSS yep. back in. Did you consider like, rather than just taking out the CSS that you thought was not being used and throwing it away, did you consider moving it to a CSS file that you would with Scott Gell's load CSS or mm -hmm. something else that you would load later? Yes, actually, um, so I didn't talk about it, but we built um, another tool called Carrot, which is the sidekick for Vimes in the Discworld books. <laughs> so Carrot actually does that for our CSS. You pass in a, um, you pass in a set of like HTML pages and then a set of CSS and it'll actually determine all of the CSS selectors that are in use and then create that same visualization which you can then go in and use to delete unused CSS from your files and keep what you need instead because yeah, by using that initial like throwing away um, what's not in use, we found it just wasn't sustainable. And uh, I don't know if you mentioned this, and I, maybe I should know. Is Vimes, uh, I know Etsy open sources a lot of stuff. Is Vimes something? So, yeah, we were planning on it, but um, we got pulled into a different project and didn't really get to it. So I'm hoping that um, while we're in our code freeze over high retail season right now, that we can get both Vimes and Carrot um, open sourced. I think we probably are going to have to change the names due to copyright infringement or whatever. But yeah, I'm hopeful that we can get them out in the next couple months. And I didn't understand Vimes totally from the slides that you had. Uh, is that something that requires a lot of manual editing of mm -hmm. JavaScript files? Yeah. And, and so is there a way to automate that? I mean, it would seem like it would be a lot of work to do that manually. Yeah, so I think the the thing that we had discovered was that, you know, first of all, well, first of all, I don't think I mentioned this, but we, we didn't serve that instrumented JavaScript to a lot of users because we found that it slowed the page down and we didn't want to affect conversion. So what we did was we took uh, four different blocks of an hour and we just served it to 1% of users. And we, so since we knew that like we didn't have literally everything. We wanted to make sure that a human being double checked what the computer thought and made sure, yes, this actually is something that can be deleted before we deleted it because we didn't trust the computers and our data to be 100% perfect. Never trust the computers. Never trust the computers, no. <laughs> um, this might be a, just a little nit thing. On the first waterfall chart that you showed, I couldn't figure, you had like five CSS files and then there were like five or six images, I forget. And then there were three JavaScript requests and I couldn't figure out how you could load JavaScript that it would come after images. I don't know. Okay, do you, <laughs> how, how, does, how do you load JavaScript now? At the bottom of the body. And with an async tag or no async tag? No async tag. We yeah. tried an async tag and everything broke. So. Um, <laughs> did that affect conversion? <laughs> that right? did. Yeah. I mean, well, we didn't find out if it affected conversion. We tried it and everything broke. And then we said, oops. Because there was stuff that was inlined in the head and inlined in the top of the document that relied, that was stuff that was loaded at the bottom of the body was relying on and yeah. yeah, it's a mess. JavaScript is a pit of snakes, so. But I think even, yeah, so that's <laughs> curious. I, I, well, I'll run, I'll run a web page test. I'll look at no, a web page test don't. waterfall over. Please, please don't. Yeah. I think most of our hard work is since 
gone the way of the donut. <laughs> and I think we have time. This one could be a longer answer or maybe not. Uh, last question, though. Um, uh, it sounds like, and I haven't examined the Etsy site very much, it sounds like you're not doing kind of an app shell or some other spa sort of. Have you thought about that? Yes, um, and that's actually, so after our code freeze for high retail season is done, my team is going to work on coming up with our front end modernization project where we're gonna actually, now that once we have Webpack and we'll be able to do ES6, we'll be able to modernize everything. We're gonna look at an app shell architecture. Um, we wanna do a bunch of experiments. We're sort of on the fence between you know, for our buyer side of the website, if the performance characteristics are gonna be good enough that we'll feel comfortable loading like the critical buying path um, in the client or if we're gonna do some server-side rendering of our JavaScript components and then let it kind of take over in the browser instead of having everything be 100% client loaded just because, you know, we want people to be able to give us money, basically. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming all this way. I hope Thank you get some you. white ties. Go Celtics. Woo! <laughs>